Here we are with Bruce Sterling, uh, the uh, godfather of Open Spime, as uh, we have been uh, so proud to call him. And uh, after a nice uh, Italian dinner, uh, he still is uh, uh, graciously accepting our company and uh, uh, sitting down for five minutes of chatting about spimes. So, Bruce, uh, I asked you uh, what is the right question to ask. Uh, and, and you told me that uh, it was, uh, what is the testable hypothesis right. to understand whether the spime idea actually has legs? Yes. So, do you I know mean, the I answer mean, or, I mean, no, or only the question? Oh, well, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a funny enterprise there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that there's a good question, but I may not know that it was the good question until it's like actually occurred, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, let's just say that uh, an asteroid hits the Earth and we're reduced to a dark age. <laughs> you know, at that point, there aren't going to be a lot of spimes around. You know, So the great question would have been, gee, why didn't you realize an asteroid was going to hit the Earth and we were going to be plunged into a dark age instead of moving on to this sort of imaginary scheme of technical development that you that you describe. So, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the whole thing was derailed by some kind of black swan as as futurists like to put it. Something that comes out of left field and, you know, I mean, just some, some really important de de development or decision that just sort of moves all that onto some sidetrack of alternate history where there's no reason to do it. Well, you, you uh, a as a profession, think about a future. Yes, I do. You are a science fiction author. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, you don't concern yourself with probable futures. You concern yourself with interesting, entertaining, engaging futures. Well, you know, as a science fiction writer, you need to get people turning pages, and science fiction is a form of popular entertainment. But um, I actually do hang out with futurists rather a lot, and I, and I also hang out with designers. When I, um, when I was you know, researching the issues that, that became that book, Shaping Things, or, or really the first time I mentioned spimes was at a, at a tech conference, SIGGRAPH. Um, I, was, I was, you know, wearing my hat as a, as, a, as a tech journalist and kind of prognosticator and design critic. So I have finally written a book which has not spimes exactly, but a lot of the related ideas from that text. And that's science fiction. And, you know, yeah, it's a thriller book. I mean, like, people run around with guns and stuff gets blown up and, you know, there's adventures and earthquakes and, you know. So uh, uh, this hasn't been published yet no, now yet, uh, as we are recording this video. Out, no. But it is coming out soon, right? Yeah, this be out summer? soon, yes. Uh-huh. So uh, can we share the title of the book? It's the... called The Caryatids. All right. Caryatids being, you know, women statues who support buildings. And these are three women who are working in tech support. They're basically tech support for ubiquitous systems, and they're trying to use their ubiquitous systems to off to you know offset crashes or collapses of some kind. Mm -hmm. So they're they're women who are spine technicians, or they, they they usually they use their own language to refer to what they're doing, because it's sixty years from the day. I mean, the one thing I can pretty well promise you is that if spimes come to exist, they won't be called spimes. Okay, you know, and that's fine. Because it's, you know, it's like calling a car a horseless carriage, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I made up the term spime just as a kind of mental placeholder or verbal placeholder. Yeah, you didn't think even at the time that it would live long as it is. Well, I think it, it would have, what I thought was that it might have a useful shelf life. That, you know, that, that it, would, it would have a kind of implicit sell-by date, which is what I liked about the term Web 2.0. Mm -hmm. It implies that... We're talking about something that we know will change and we know will end. And, and since I think all technologies are transitional technologies, I think it's very handy to have terms that we know, you know, won't last forever. So that's a little problematic for the earlier question I was asking. So, so if you say, how do you know you were right about spimes or wrong about spimes? And then I say, well, you know, to be right will be that will certainly mean that nobody uses the word spimes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean that seems self-defeating, right? 
It's like, well, here we are in the year 2030, and there are no spimes, so you must have been wrong. No, that's not what's going to make me wrong. Yeah. Um, that's, that's not one of the signifiers that nobody uses the word spy. So, so do you also mean implicitly that unless there is some disruptive uh, cataclysm, uh, the Internet of Things is bound to come in one shape or the other? You know, I, I have told people that, and you know, I feel pretty confident about it, but it may be so different from what I call an Internet of Things that it doesn't really deserve that term at all. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, to call an Internet of Things an Internet of Things is really like calling a horse, a, a car, a horseless carriage. If you really had a world where every object had a network address and they were compiling histories and they had the like the kind of six or seven danger warning signs of spymedom that I describe, it would make today's internet look extremely primitive, like like you know a Marconi wireless radio. Yes. You know, and they, and they called it wireless for a long time because it's a it was the wireless telegraph originally radio. That's right. right? But now you've got Marconi's wireless telegraph built into say you know cell phones. I mean, this thing here is you know my little cell phone here, which is really pretty close to a, to a primitive spine is using Marconi's technology and you know and it's a wireless telephone but so if I were to say if I were if I had predicted the wireless telephone and then went into the future and people were using wireless telephones nobody would say oh look at his wireless telephone they well, would say thing look at his handy look at his telefonino yeah. look at his cell you know I, I, I I've got to tell you Bruce your phone is, is, is not what we in Italy call cell phones, really. Right. <laughs> it is kind of, kind of basic. <laughs> well, I, I, I hate to break this to you. This cell phone came from a dead man. This is actually a, okay. an inherited cell phone from a guy who, who died recently. Well, that is so, a whole bunch of emotional a, content. There, there is that. And um, it's also a uh, recycled cell phone. Okay, so that's even more spimy. It is rather spimy. Okay. And, uh, you know, it seems to get my job done, although the battery life's not for the best. I mean, you know, I should have the iPhone and so forth, but, you know, I've just got my own, like, interventions. Okay. Like, you know, that I'm used to. I like to screw up these devices because... I mean, let me show you my 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 other ever handy pocket. This is one of the world's only only editions of a Nikon Ool. You can see it's the Ool, <laughs> and it's that's the the rarely known Co model. <laughs> it's, it's a Co. So so you know, and make so, and make magazine circles. We're very into post consumer alteration and avoiding the warranty. Absolutely, you you so, look you know, like a hardware hacker. If, if, if you're gonna like crack shells and void warranties and that sort of thing, you definitely want one of these babies and not you know. So do you own a 3D printer yet? Uh, no, I don't. Wouldn't you want to soon? I would re much rather you know hire somebody to run one you know or, or, or run something off Pinoco or yeah so so you, know. you, you want a Kinko for three D printing you know even more than that I think I just want a, a web service where I can do as little as possible and just sort of have the thing at the door I mean I think Pinoco's got the right idea about this um, you know Pinoco being a web two point based service that tries to connect uh, designers directly to customers by sort of handling rapid manufacturing. Would you like to spell that? P-O-N-O-K-O. -O. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of critics darlings in the American tech press, or they were for a while. It, yeah, they, they have a kind of unique or ingenious Web 2.0 manufacturing app. You know, a kind of sister company to them that's done pretty well for themselves is Etsy, E-T-S-Y. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>